So, rhythm games, let's talk about them. You don't like them, I get it, you suck at them. You got about as much rhythm as a broken clock. You hit the dance floor and people steal like they would a traffic accident. But roasting session aside, let me tell you about Hi-Fi Rush. Hi-Fi Rush accomplishes something that makes the most sense when you break down its design, and it's the first truly successful attempt at it. Like peanut butter and chocolate, it combines the rhythm game and character action game genres together. However, it doesn't simply slap these two genres together haphazardly. Instead, it delivers a game that's not only fun and stylish, but also, at the grass's mechanics, addictive. If you come this far, then chances are you want details. So allow me to give you the rundown. I used to run this facility. Now, you have me stacking boxes. But I'll say, this is a fine stack. A great job. The story of Hi-Fi Rush could be thrown straight into a Saturday morning TV show or a 90s Disney movie. You know, when Disney still cared about cartoon animation and the like. You play as Chai, a wannabe rock star who stumbles into a humanitarian project with the sole purpose of helping and improving those with disabilities. A mishap occurs during production that causes the whole facility to move to the beat of Chai's music player now stuck to his chest, along with a cool new robot arm. And this is where the rhythm game component originates. Chai eventually discovers the truth about the project's corruption through a cast of interesting characters, all with their own stake in taking down the company behind the project. But this is also where the story stumbles. Chai as a character is downright insufferable. Like they took Dante, stripped away all his confidence, replaced it with fake confidence, and gave him an IQ in the low double digits. Listen, I'm all for character flaws, but Jesus Christ. There is a redemption arc in all of this, however. At times, Chai starts to gain real confidence throughout the story, which is then brought down again by him still being insufferable. But if you can look past that, like I did, then you'll find that there's a lot of fun to be had in the story. Just don't expect it to be the mainstay of the game. Also, quick side note, noticing a head-scratching trend of large, muscly, roided-up women in entertainment lately. Regardless, the gameplay for me was the main draw. They have destroyed me stack, and the memories remain. Oh, what a good job it was. The character action rhythm game mix is my favorite part of Hi-Fi Rush. Think Devil May Cry meets Crypt of the Necrodancer. Hell, there's even some references within the combat system taken from the Demon Slayer himself, leading me to suspect that there might have been some former Capcom talent on the team during the game's development, at least other than the one I'll get into later. Everything you'd expect from a character action game is here. An in-depth combo system that grows as you purchase new combos, upgrades to health, and special attack meters, performance ratings based on how unique your combos were, and more. The kicker is that it's all done to the beat of the music. However, you are not required to do this stuff on the beat, like the developers found that most people don't have rhythm or something. So you're not outright punished for not comboing on the beat, but rewarded if you do. I personally loved this particular mixture of gameplay because, as a veteran character action fan, it challenged me to try doing everything I've learned over decades of experience to the beat of music. And this works well when you understand how combos work in character action games, fighting games, etc. For example, and this works in the aforementioned genres as well, every input for a combo is like a steady beat in a song. You can rapidly mash it out, but if it's inconsistent, you'll either drop the combo or the game will pick up what you're trying to do. Because Hi-Fi Rush is about comboing on beat, this teaches players not to mash out combos and gives them a better understanding of how they work by simply staying on beat and rewarding them for doing so. Hell, it even teaches what a brief pause is in a combo, telling a player to skip a beat before inputting the rest. This pause is something games like Devil May Cry and Bayonetta also have, but the rhythm game stuff doesn't stop there. Platforming and minigames are also in tune with the beat of the music, but sadly those are not so lenient on rhythmically challenged players. <laughs> oh. 
A con to the rhythm game aspect is that it also suffers from typical rhythm game issues, where the beat isn't always perfectly synced up with whatever song is playing, which increasingly worsens over the course of the game. Oh, and uh, unsolicited info, it might surprise you that the executive producer is a former Capcom and Platinum Games employee, Shinji Mikami. Yes, that Shinji Mikami. And this was his last project at Tango Softworks before leaving the company after 12 years. Bigger. Stronger. Is this promo for Rekka or motivation for the rest of us? I'm trying to make this a better place to work. And look at you. Showing off. With Hi-Fi Rush being part rhythm game, it stands to reason that music would be an important part of its design. The downside, whether or not you care for the music or the genres it pulls from. Featuring a variety of tracks from rock, dance, and techno remix, and using anything from licensed music from groups like Nine Inch Nails all the way down to The Prodigy. But it also features a mix of songs made in-house by the studio, which you'll hear the most in moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. Each level has its own song that the gameplay sings itself to. And when the song has an increased tempo, the beats in the gameplay will also be a bit faster. I also noticed the animations in combat are also speed increased to help keep up with the tempo. My one gripe with the in-house music is that it's mostly one genre, and even though the songs have different names by different artists, they tend to sound very samey and blend together after a while. And that's something you'll have to get used to if you're a content creator and you have to play the game in streamer mode. But it's got style and heart behind it, which leads me to my last point, the visuals. If I had to describe the graphics and visuals of Hi-Fi Rush, I would call it a fascinating blend of East and West, Japan and the US to be precise. And it shows. The art style is more Western inspired, sprinkled with Eastern influences here and there. It makes sense when you consider the studio, Tango Softworks, is a mix of both Eastern and Western developers. The result is a visual style that's over the top and brimming with a range of bright colors, flashing lights, and references to popular and hilariously flamboyant anime. Go, go, go! But enough talk! Plus, it features a variety of environments throughout the campaign, from production factories to active volcanoes to museums, although it leans pretty heavily on the factory part for a while. What I found particularly interesting is the mix of both 3D and 2D that it bounces back and forth from. In-game is always 3D, where the gameplay moves at a smooth frame rate, while the cutscenes move at a cinematic low frame rate. Because it sports a cel-shaded cartoon art style, detail isn't quite as important, which is great when it comes to performance. Consoles don't seem to have any issues running it, and a PC made within the last six years or so shouldn't have any issues as well, as photorealism is not what it's shooting for. It also does the Platinum game staple of transitioning between 3D and 2D perspectives. But I think I've covered enough about what I like about this game. Let's bring this thing home. Hi-Fi Rush is one of those games that took me by surprise when it was announced, especially when you consider that it was a shadow drop release, announced and released at the same time with little to no marketing behind it. So I was pretty cautious about whether or not it was a fully-fledged video game or a short art piece with all style and no substance. I'm pleased to say that I was wrong about the latter, and perhaps this video alone debunks any doubt about substance. And while I found its protagonist to be kind of a drag, even after his redemption arc, I still really enjoyed my time overall, and ought to have played it through a few times, including the time I used to record all the footage you see here. Sadly, I know the game didn't sell that well, so the chances of a sequel are pretty low. This is unfortunate because, again, this is one of those video games that embraces itself being a video game, and there are far too few of those these days, especially in the AAA space. Regardless, I was pleasantly surprised and impressed enough for it to become one of my favorite games of 2023, and I hope it opens the door for other devs to build upon the foundation it set in the future.